when we look at the disparities from where we sit here, on this side of Mass Avenue, the life expectancy is 80 plus for a Caucasian person. When we just go down the road a mile mm. on the other side of the road, the life expectancy is a little less than 70 uh, years of age. So we have a lot of work to do here uh, in the city. Hello, it's lovely to be with you, June Cooper, Old South Church theologian in the city, community activist extraordinaire and educator. Welcome to our Phyllis Wheatley 250 vlog series. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work, please? Certainly. Well, you're in the, in the space that I, uh, I'm so privileged to, uh, to work for Old South Church and to serve as the theologian in the city, which basically means that I work to get the people out of the pews into the city, into the work of doing justice, into mercy ministries, into the work of creating beauty in the city. So I'm so... A very uh, necessary role. Right. And from being here, and I've, I've worked here and hanging out here for about 10 years, I got to learn about Phyllis Wheatley. Because growing up as a, as a little girl in Newport, Rhode Island, very white, privileged, others, not myself. My dad was a, a Baptist minister. Oh. Phyllis Wheatley got maybe a sentence in the, uh, in the history, mm -hmm. in the history class. Mm -hmm. So when I came here and learned that Phyllis Wheatley um, was a member of this congregation, it made me feel so proud Absolutely. Uh, and curious and set me on a path of discovery to find out who was she, who she is. Well, tell us about your work in Boston over the last 20 years, because you've been quite a trailblazer yourself. <sighs> well, my work has always been about uh, representing, advocating, and empowering uh, disenfranchised people. And the majority of my work, I would say, a, a good portion has focused on women, uh, has focused on infant mortality, uh -huh. has focused on uh, women who are um, struggling with housing insecurity. Um, so that's one part of the work. And then the other part is the, um, the justice work of leading and being part of something uh, we had going here real strong, the Poor People's Campaign with Dr. William Barber. Or when the bridge to Long Island closed down, Long Island was a place where many of our, our homeless people um, stayed. Uh, the bridge was closed abruptly in 2015, and so I organized faith leaders to come together and figure out a way that we could um, uh, offer services to our unhoused sisters and brothers. And then that work got picked up in a thread with the new organization that myself and others have started uh, called um, Faith Leaders for Housing Justice, mm -hmm. addressing the, um, the epidemic that we see um, at the corners of Mass Avenue yeah. and Molina Cass, yes. of opioid addiction, yeah. um, homelessness, yeah. housing is unaffordable, and mental health issues. So they have been doing that strong for the last two years. And doing it successfully. Your, your work is well respected and well renowned in terms of its impact. In your experience, having done all the work you've just described, how much progress have you seen in Boston in terms of harnessing the talents of black people, black residents, in the last few decades? Well, I have seen, I think we've got, we've got some good things going here. We, um, you know, uh, with, the, with the murder of George Floyd, the narrative and the stories got popped up and there was a lot of commitment. And so um, as a result of that, we've seen uh, some new openings. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the first black attorney general um, here in Massachusetts and there's a lot of good things happening but at the same but at the same time uh, we know that systemic racism has not gone away mm -hmm. when we look at the disparities from where we sit here on this side of Mass Avenue the life expectancy is 80 plus for a Caucasian person when we just go down the road a mile mm. on the other side of the road the life expectancy is a little less than 70 
uh, years of age. So we have a lot of work to do here uh, in the city. In terms of your work as a woman of faith, as you know, mm -hmm. Faith was a woman of faith, how does that empower you to continue to, to, to work to, to bring this transformation that you're describing that we need forward and do all the vital work in spite of the obstacles? Well, I, you know, Phyllis Wheatley um, has a poem, and I don't know exactly which one it is, because you're the scholar on that. But as I read that poem, she said, implanted in each person's breast is this idea oh. and notion of freedom yes. and liberation. Yes, and so I love that poem. I feel that that got implanted in me somehow. Yeah. As a little girl, I knew exactly what I wanted to do really? when I was in junior high. I wanted to help people, but then mm -hmm. as I became older, I realized that I wanted to change systems. And I wanted to, um, to not only provide tangible things that people need, like coats for kids or food, mm -hmm. but we needed to go upstream to look at why are the babies keep coming downstream with with nothing and poverty. Mm -hmm. So um, I always wanted to address those systemic issues and I had great role models to do that. Who were your role models? Oh my goodness, Martin Luther King, the TV, when I grew up in the 60s, set in the kitchen. So every night that was the story. Yeah. And I so much wanted to get out in the street. And work. And to demonstrate, and I was like 13 or 14 and my parents wouldn't dare not allow yet, not it, yet. not yet. But certainly I was surrounded by that. And that just, it made my heart want to do something. So you come from a tradition of activism, of engaged faith. Ex it's not hair, it's pie in the sky, religiosity. It's right. about right. making it work mm -hmm. in the world. And you're, as I say, a, a Boston luminary. Where are you? Where do you see Boston's movement, forward movement, in the next 50 years in terms of harnessing again that talent, which is everywhere, mm -hmm. but not always equally mm -hmm. supported? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've got to do more. Um, on the political scene around educating our young people, um, that they really need to understand how systems work and how they're a part of those systems um, in a good way or in a, in a way that has impacted them and have, have kept them oppressed. I think that our future lies in this process of educating people, empowering people. People do not want to hand out. They want to hand up. And so to open those doors of opportunity, we are so um, fortunate in the city to have our first mayor mm -hmm. of color and, and, and it's a woman. Amazing and so woman. It's an amazing woman. Yeah. Our city council has shifted. It, it is very You'll see black the changes. and brown. We're seeing the changes. Although but that's now, visual. We that's need... visual. Now we've got to go a little yeah. deeper yeah. Uh, and work towards really trying to shift those narratives and shift the way that people think and get people um, out of the boxes and help people to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Phyllis Wheatley was uncomfortable. Oh, I'm yeah. Sure she was. Well, she, as you know, she was an enslaved woman, and mm -hmm. in spite of all those obstacles, she persisted, p produced the work, did the work, mm -hmm. and actually had it published in London. She had to leave Boston to get yes. her work out in the world. Yeah. Modern day Bostonians are hopefully getting more of the support here. Mm -hmm. than 250 years ago. But in general, in terms of the, the value of people studying people like Phyllis, what is the, the role of history in helping harness the, the innate power and capacity mm. of people? Well, you know what they say, I think there's a saying, if we don't remember our history, we're bound to repeat it. Um, Phyllis can teach us so much about a I imagine her to be a woman who was probably half my size, very small in stature. <laughs> she was meant to be quite frail. Well, she was yeah. frail, yeah. She went through the middle passage. So. She went through the middle passage. She was probably malnutrition. Seven and, years old. So, and, yeah. you know, a psychological stuff going Trauma, on. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's like, how do we keep, you know, how do we keep going yeah. back? And yeah. of course, we're going to get knocked down. But I think that's where the faith part comes in. Because Phyllis believed in, um, she saw God and she saw a possibility mm -hmm. in her poem, Imagination, yeah. where she saw something different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to be able to help our young people um, see 
something different. Mm -hmm. So when you start to see a vision, you can start to act on it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the doors need to be open because all of our kids have dreams. So they many people, dreams. young people have said to me when they learned about mm -hmm. Phyllis at school, they said, wow, she did that back then. Yes. And it does galvanize people. Mm -hmm. It gives them a sense of, if she did it, I can do it. Yeah. Possibility. So I think you're Possibility, absolutely right. Possibility, hope. Yeah, hope, hope. is, a, is yeah. a key thing. Yeah. Faith and hope, very, very important. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of sharing your work with our well, audience? Well, I, um, I have, uh, and you, <laughs> have inspired me oh. to just continue to, uh, to follow and learn more about Phyllis Wheatley. Mm -hmm. And um, as a minister, and um, as I think about when we go back to um, have service, when, we, when I say we, Old South Church, when we go back to have service the Sunday before Thanksgiving in our old space, yes. um, I always think about Phyllis and I, okay. I see her sitting up in that balcony and I think about how she heard those sermons from those white ministers. Yes. But what, I, what I, I've come to understand is that two people can grow up in the same household and have different experiences. Yes, yes. I think Phyllis sat in those pews as, a, as an enslaved woman and had a very different yes. experience of those stories. Yes. When she heard about Moses leading the yes. people, yes. she said, those are my liberation. Yes. She heard a story about yes. liberation. Uh, the, I it just preached about the woman at the well and how um, Jesus and, and there's this, encounters the Sumerian women, and these are supposed to be arch enemies, but Jesus says, no, come on, let's, yeah. you know, let's, let's, I'm, I'm accepting of everyone. There's a message in that. Yeah. So I think Phyllis heard those stories and saw herself yeah. with this, yeah. with her faith. I yeah. think she saw Jesus. I think she saw God and The Bible and has sustained her. people through yeah. all sorts of trials and today, the continuing tribulations. I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So I love Phyllis Wheatley. And if she were here today, I would just be thanking her and giving her a big old fat hug. <laughs> well, as you know, you mentioned Old South, Old Old South. We're doing a play, a site-specific okay. play, because as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Phyllis was a congregant there, which will be in November. So I'm hoping you'll be able to join us. Well, I hope so too. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful interview. June Cooper, you've Thank been a you. pleasure. Bless you. Thank you. In your work. Hi, I'm June Cooper. This is Phyllis Wheatley 250. Phyllis forever.